Welcome to part two of personality. This is some of my favorite topic in all of psychology, not the Freud stuff, but the defense mechanisms that we're going to go over today. All right, and let's get started. Now, first of all, this is important. Now, history is not a huge part of psychology. A lot of teachers over teach it, but this is really fundamental to the study of psychology. And this is one of the major perspectives. It's called the psychodynamic perspective. Now, anytime you hear the word psychodynamic, I want you to think, boom, I want you to think Sigmund Freud, and I want you to think unconscious. Let me say that again, unconscious. I even underlined it here. Yes, there's a lot of other stuff on here. This I have my students write this down. So anytime you hear a psychologist talking about dream analysis or uh, little boys are unconsciously attracted to their moms. You know, that's the psychodynamic perspective. Okay. And the founder, the granddaddy of the psychodynamic perspective is called Sigmund Freud. And there's a picture of him right there, two pictures of him. Sigmund Freud is way back in the day. Um, he was, he was a, a neurologist from Austria. And so he, he visited, well, he had a lot of really rich Jewish women who came to him who were a little off, if you know what I mean. And, and you know, people are like, what's wrong with these women? Let's send them to the neurologist. And you know, they didn't know who to send them to. And Dr. Freud, after years of talking to these women and men, uh, he started to come up with some theories. Now, some of them are good and some of them are crazy. But that's the way it is with early in a science. You know, you get philosophers, people who come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. He is the father of psychoanalysis. So we'll get into psychoanalysis in the therapy chapter. All right. But psychoanalysis is, a, is the first form of psychotherapy. And what does this therapy do? It gets into your unconscious mind. Everything is about the unconscious. So basically, this is the summary of this philosophy. We are driven by unconscious forces, unconscious sexual forces, unconscious aggressive forces, you know, and, and it basically Freud said that we, we take these uncomfortable thoughts that we have and we push them down and then they come out a little bit by bit in the form of anxiety. You know, and that, that explains some forms of mental disorders. Okay. And so what, what Freud did was he described our mind like an iceberg. So take a look at this iceberg. Notice that the top part above the water is relatively small. And beneath the surface is much larger. So Sigmund Freud said that our mind is like an iceberg. Our conscious mind, which is the above the, the line part, the above the water part, that's our conscious mind. That's the part of our mind that we are aware of. Like right now, you're sitting here on your computer uh, listening to me. Your unconscious mind is much larger and much more important. Now, I'm not saying that. Freud said that. That's how psychodynamic people are. They believe that the unconscious mind is more important than everything else. Okay. Now, these three terms are important, and I have seen them on the AP exam, and we do write these down. So, Sigmund Freud took our personality and divided it into three parts. Now, I want you to think back to that image of the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. And the devil is saying, do it, do the bad stuff. That's your id. The devil, the pleasure principle is the id. That's the part of you that wants you to fulfill your unconscious animalistic impulses. So if you want to go home and eat an entire half gallon of ice cream, that's your id talking. 
If you want to just skip school and go downtown and spend the day, that's your id talking. Your id wants pleasure. Okay? But then your super ego, your super ego is the angel on your other shoulder. It's your conscience. It's that part of you that says, always do the moral thing. All right, let me say that again. Always do the moral thing. Okay, so your super ego says to go home and eat a salad. Your super ego says to show up on time to school and, you know, and do all your work and do everything the moral way. Do the, do the moral thing. Okay. It says to help old ladies cross the street. But then in the middle of all this, you got your id on one shoulder. You've got your super ego on your other. But where do you come in in all this? Well, you are the ego. That's you. Ego is Latin for self. Okay? So when somebody says you have an inflated ego, they mean that you have an inflated sense of self. So your ego is based on the reality principle. And it moderates between the id and the superego. Your ego always wants to do the right thing. Not always the moral thing, but the right thing. So some of y'all are like, but wait a minute, the super ego said to always do the moral thing. Now, but how's that different than the right thing? Let me explain. If you're driving down the road and somebody is on the side of the road and they need help, is it moral to pull over and help these people on the side of the road? Yes, that is the moral thing to do. But is it the right thing to do? Not necessarily. You could get robbed. You get hit by a car pulling over to the side of the road. It's very dangerous. So doing the moral thing is not always the same as doing the right thing. Okay? So you might get this if you're a gamer. Think about that. Hit pause. Okay? So what TV characters are driven by the id? Which characters are very animalistic and pleasure-oriented? I should have added Rick Sanchez to this. I still have Homer. I still have Beavis and Butthead. Peter Griffin is a good example, too. Okay, pleasure first. Now, what about superego? Now, think about the Simpsons. Who always does the moral thing, even when it's inconvenient? That's Lisa Simpson. She always does the moral thing, and it is so annoying. Ego, or voice of reason. Well, I know Marge isn't perfect, but... But Marge balances the id desires of Bart and the super ego desires of Lisa. Okay? So sometimes Marge will make a compromise between what Bart wants and what Lisa wants. Makes a compromise. That's what the ego does. So let me, let's give an example. So let's say... Um, you want to go home and eat an entire half gallon of ice cream. And your, and, and your super ego says, go home and eat salad. Well, what is a reasonable amount of ice cream to eat? Maybe a big scoop, maybe two scoops. That is your ego. That is a normal, rational amount of ice cream to eat. Okay? That's more of a joke. So you are the ego. The id is the devil. And the angel is the superego, okay? The morals, the sense of morals. All right, so let's try some multiple choice. According to Freud, the personality structure that reflects moral values, let me say that again, moral values is called the, all right, hit pause if you need to. That is called the superego, the superego, okay? All right. In Freudian theory, which of the following components of personality most resembles a conscience or sensor? Okay, conscience, morals. The answer is superego. That is E, superego. Okay? All right. In Sigmund Freud's view, the role of the ego is to what? 
Okay, so hit, hit the space bar, hit pause for a minute. The answer is C. It mediates between the id, the superego, and reality. The ego is based in reality, makes a realistic decision. Okay? According, in accord with psychoanalytic theory, one of the primary functions of the superego is to what? Okay, hit pause. The answer is E, conscience, conscience. Okay, all right, one of my favorite topics because I've seen it in people. I've done a lot of these. I think we've all done these. Uh, these are ego defense mechanisms. Okay, so think about this. What is a defense mechanism? A defense mechanism is, well, in the animal kingdom, a defense mechanism is what an animal does to protect itself from predators. But humans don't really have a lot of predators. Humans, we don't want to protect ourselves from predators. We want to protect ourselves from painful emotions. We don't like to feel bad. So these defense mechanisms, we do this stuff to make us feel better. You're going to recognize some of these. Some of these you won't. There are nine defense mechanisms, and I highly suggest you have all nine of these memorized. Okay, so let's get started. Repression. Notice I have press underlined. Repression is when something horrible and traumatic happens to you, and you press it down into the unconscious. So you forget it. Okay, so think of it as like amnesia. So let's say you witness a murder and the cops ask you, what did you see? And you're like, I don't know. I don't remember anything. Okay, um, let's say you something traumatic happens to you and you don't remember it. Now, I don't mean this like you hit your head and damaged your brain. I mean, this is psychological. We call this repression. Now, that's what Freud called it. In modern day, we call this dissociative amnesia. Okay. So check it out. Repression. You take an uncomfortable memory and you press it down into the unconscious. Press it down. Okay. You don't want to remember it. You want to forget it. Okay. Rationalization. So we commit a sin. We do something and it makes us feel bad about ourselves. We might steal a candy bar from Walmart, or we might be late for school, or we might cheat on, a, on homework or something. And then what we do is we try to convince ourselves that what we did wasn't that bad. And how do we do that? We say, well, I wasn't the only one who did it. I do that when I'm late for school, I always look around for other teachers to see if any other teachers were later than I was. And then it makes me feel good because I'm not the latest one. Okay. Um, you know, you, you steal something from Walmart and you say, well, I spend hundreds of dollars a month at this store. You know, that you're just rationalizing and you're trying to make yourself feel better. Everyone else is doing it. So, if um, you don't do your project and then you you whisper to somebody, hey, hey, did you do your project? And somebody's like, no, I didn't do it. You didn't do it either. And then you make you makes you feel better about yourself. Rationalization is dangerous because we do bad things and then we feel OK about it. Regression. Now, remember repression. That was with a P. Regression is with a G. Think about regress as going back in time, going backwards, the opposite of progress. So instead of progress, you are regressing in terms of maturity. So something, something stressful is happening to you, and how do you deal with it? You act immaturely. Okay? You might throw a tantrum. Wah, 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 wah. Okay? You might... Uh, a soldier in wartime might start crying for mommy or fighting uh, a fighting adult couple might 
plugged ears ago, I can't hear you. La, 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 la. I can't hear you. La, 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 la. Yo mama. No, yo mama. No, yo mama. Acting immaturely as a way to deal with stress. Displacement. So check it out. Place means place. Dis means wrong. Wrong place. So when you take your anger out on the wrong place, that's displacement. So let's say you get mad at your teacher and you slam the door. That's displacement. Or you get mad at your girlfriend and you kick your dog. Arf! That would be displacement. The dog didn't do anything to you. You're just taking your anger out on the dog. Or you're playing a video game and you throw the controller across the room. Or you might have seen those videos of people destroying their televisions when their sports doesn't go the right way. That's displacement. So if you're, you get mad and you go pee on your teacher's car. Projection. You take something about yourself and you see that flaw in somebody else. Think of yourself as a projector and you start to see your own flaws in other people. So let's say you're impatient. Then you accuse everybody else of being impatient. True story. My mother-in-law says that me and my wife were late all the time. That's not true, though, though we're not late all the time. She is late all the time. So she accuses us of being late all the time. That's projection. So let's say you have a temper problem and you accuse other people of having a temper problem. Oh, and if your boyfriend is accusing you of cheating and he's looking through your phone, he is probably cheating. He's accusing you of doing what he is doing. Girls do the same thing. So when people project their own faults onto others, they generally do not deny that themselves possess those faults. But when we see our own faults in other people, when they're not really there, we are projecting. So your partner tells you how selfish you are when in fact they are the one who is selfish. Okay, pause and read that. I'm gonna move on. Reaction formation, acting the opposite of how you truly feel. Now, why on earth would you ever wanna do that? Well. Think about it this way. Let's say you're going to fake it till you make it. I do that every Monday morning. You think I want to get up and teach on first thing Monday morning? Not really. But you know what? I get up there and I, I fake it till I make it. I play loud music. I clap my hands and, and I'm just, I put on a show when in fact I just want to you know, go home and go to bed. It's nothing personal. It's just sometimes we got to fake it till we make it. And because we want to feel that way. So let's say you have a bad breakup and then you tell yourself, you know what? I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I will survive. Anyway, so you, you tell yourself everything's going to be okay. You act the opposite. So check out this gif. She's crying and then boom, she says, nope, I'm not crying anymore. And then she's like, nope, moving on. I'm awesome. I'm great. Everything's going to be just fine. It's a great gift. Okay. So reaction formation would be if you hate your dad, you go up to your dad and say, I love you, dad. You're the greatest dad in the world. You act the opposite. What is denial? It's not just a river in Egypt. It is when you refuse to believe the truth. OK, so we refuse to accept horrible news, even with evidence to the contrary. So you go to a doctor, your doctor says you have cancer, you have six months to live. And you go, no, no, no. See, I'm going to go get another doctor. You go to another doctor, they tell you the same thing. 
Yeah, no, no, I'm not going to die. That's denial. That's denial when you refuse to believe the obvious truth. Okay. Um, the reason when you go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, you start off with, hi, my name's Aaron, I'm an alcoholic. Well, that's because you're trying to get over the denial of having a drinking problem. Alcoholics have to get over the denial before they can start working on themselves. Sublimation. Take a flaw about yourself and turn that flaw into something positive. The most common example is you have an aggression problem and you get into a lot of fights. So what are you going to do with all that aggression? Well, go join the football team. Go join the wrestling team. Go join the boxing team. Remember Mean Girls? What did Regina George do at the end of the movie with all that rage? She joined the lacrosse team as a positive outlet for her rage. Okay, so, um, you know, so basically that's the most common example is taking aggression and turning it into something positive. Now, displacement, that's different because you're not turning, kicking the dog out of anger is not doing something positive. Okay, uh, true story. I hated my stepdad. You, so you know what? I went and worked out in the gym and I was the biggest, strongest eighth grader you've ever seen in your life. So I took my rage and I put it in something positive. So if you hate your dad, take it out on the football team. That's sublimation. Do something positive with your rage. And finally, compensation. Now, Freud did not come up with this one. This was, this was come up with by a guy named Alfred Adler. Compensation is when you have a flaw and you do something different really well to make up for that flaw. So let's just say you were picked on as a kid and you felt horrible about yourself. You had what's called an inferiority complex. So what do you do? You go be a mall cop and you pick on kids at the mall. Okay. You remember why Peter drove this car in this episode? Okay. What's he compensating for? And why are the smallest dogs always the meanest dogs? Because they're compensating. Okay. They're compensating. I would say that's called the Napoleon complex, but Napoleon wasn't short. That was a myth. But the myth goes is that Napoleon was short, so he took over all of Europe. But that's a myth. He wasn't short. All right, so let's do some multiple choice and finish this up. According to Freud, which is the most important factor in personality? The answer is B, unconscious. Okay, hit the space bar and hit pause and do this question. Which of the following examples best illustrates the defense mechanism of regression? Okay, so look at your notes or something like that. What is regression? All right, so it's acting immaturely. So the answer is A, because it's a temper tantrum. Okay. Angry with this professor because of a difficult exam, Martin returns home and takes out his anger on his best friend. So what's Martin doing? He's taking his anger out on the wrong place. Wrong place. This question, I missed it when I first saw it. I got this out of a test bank. I don't think I got this off the AP exam. Hal is fearful of men who are friendly toward him. Convinced that they are all homosexuals attempting to seduce him. Should it be the case that Hal is himself a latent homosexual in the closet, fearful of admitting this even to himself, we might conclude that he is using the defense mechanisms of repression and what? Okay, now he's not in denial, okay? But what he is doing is he's saying that since I'm gay, then everyone else is coming on to me and everyone else is gay. So the answer is B. For years, I thought it was A, but Hal isn't acting the opposite here, okay? 
It is widely known in Jerry's social circle that he is the most stubborn and inflexible member of the group. Yet Jerry complains that all his friends are opinionated and rigid. So what's Jerry doing? Hit pause and think about it. What he's doing is he's accusing everyone else of doing what he's doing. So this is projection. He's taking his own flaws and projecting them onto his friends. When parents refuse to accept several psychologists' diagnosis of a child's mental illness, they are using which of the following defense mechanisms? Okay, so if they're refusing to accept, they're in denial. No, there's nothing wrong with my little boy. He's just fine. A man who has numerous reasons to hate his mother instead lavishes her with unrealistic amounts of attention and love. So he's acting the opposite. So hit pause. The answer is C, reaction formation. He's acting the opposite. Okay. All right. That is it. That is it. This is just a, a little quiz. And this is what we did in class. And now, so what's wrong with Freud? We did write this down. This is important. What are criticisms of Freud's theory? Well, for one, Freud just made this stuff up. He wasn't a scientist. He did not do experiments. He didn't do anything in a laboratory. He kind of just made this stuff up. His theories are not scientific, period. Also, his theories are very sexist and not multicultural. He didn't study Chinese. He didn't study Latinas. He only studied people who came to him. Okay, he didn't do a random selection of people from the population. He only studied the people who were crazy enough to come to him. So his sample wasn't a good sample. So his theories are a little off. And they were sexist. The craziest thing that Freud ever said was, get this, this is crazy. He said that women blame and resent their mothers because women don't have a penis. That's called penis envy. Even Freud's own daughter was like, come on, dad, that's ridiculous. Now, but Freud did have some good theories. First of all, what happens to you in your childhood does affect you it, to some extent for the rest of your life. Okay, he was the first person to say that, and that is true. Another thing, now we may not be able to point to the unconscious mind, but information outside of our awareness does influence us. That is true. That has been demonstrated in the laboratory. And the defense mechanisms are pretty good. They do describe some of our behaviors. So, multiple choice. One criticism of Freud's psychosexual theory of development is that what? Okay, so what's a criticism of Freud? And the answer is D, it's not scientific. All right, don't make a big deal out of this guy, but his name is Carl Jung. And he was a student of Sigmund Freud. And he said, yes, we do have an unconscious mind. He agreed with Freud, but he said also that we have what's called an, a collective unconscious, meaning that me, you, Beyonce, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, all of us, we all share a part of our collective unconscious. That it's kind of like a cloud drive. Why does he think that? And this is getting into way more detail than you need to know, but Carl Jung traveled the world and he studied cultures from around the world. He says that every single person in the stadium has a piece of a shared memory trace. I know some of you are thinking of Assassin's Creed and I know why. But um, today we would say that that's just genetics. But Carl Jung, this is like way back in the early 1900s, and he said that all of us share a little piece of our unconscious minds. The reason he thinks that is because he went around the world and he studied the legends of other people. Every, le every, every people around the world has stories of witches, wise old men, messiah, a messiah is somebody who comes from a faraway place and saves the world. Okay. 
So this is the only time I've ever seen this, him on the AP exam. Carl Jung believed in a storehouse of latent, that means hidden, latent memory traces inherited from a person's ancestral past. What do we call that storehouse? The answer is E, collective unconscious. Remember, history isn't that important. Okay. And finally, I've never seen him on the, on the exam, but Alfred Adler, he studied a few things. He, he said that we have an inferiority complex, meaning we all feel bad about ourselves and we are constantly striving to make up for that. You remember when I said compensation earlier? Um, he called it overcompensation. So um, the reason we drive a big pickup truck maybe is because we feel bad about ourselves for some reason. Okay, or maybe we bully people because we feel bad about ourselves. He also studied birth order, like firstborn, middle child, baby of the family, but there is no scientific basis for that. Those are all myths, okay, as far as firstborns act this way, middle child children act this way. Those are all stereotypes. They, they're just no, there's no basis for that. And I've never seen him on the AP exam, so that's about it. Okay. All right. So thank you. Hope, hope that was useful.